Hello, and welcome to another edition of the NAIC Insight Series. I am your host, Bob Green, and I am delighted to be joined today by my friend and colleague, Mr. Robert Rabin. Welcome, Robert. Thank you so much, Bob. I'm very, very excited and happy to be with you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So let's jump right in. So, Robert, you um, have founded a firm many years ago that does advocacy work on a variety of issues, the uh, aptly named Rabin Group. And part of the way we came to know each other specifically is around the creation of something called the Diverse Asset Managers Initiative. Tell us about the initiative and uh, and uh, what what exactly you're focused on through DAMI. Absolutely. And thank you. And, and to you and your membership uh, for being such a crucial uh, source of information, knowledge, and frankly, inspiration as we do this work. The Diverse Asset Managers Initiative is an independent campaign. By that, I mean it's a C3 um, that uh, relies on contribu contributions from a diverse group of people to accomplish one clear goal, which is to significantly increase allocations to firms owned or managed by women and people of color. There's a lot more to be said about the why and the how, and my guess is we'll get to that. But we established the Diverse Asset Managers Initiative probably seven years ago now when I observed within your field, financial services generally and asset management specifically, profound underutilization of women and people of color. And this is an effort that we constituted uh, to do our part to shift this system. Outstanding, outstanding. So we are definitely going to have time to explore Dami and talk a lot about that. But I would be remiss if, as is our custom in this, to kind of go back and give people a perspective on who you are and where you came from and how you got into uh, the work that you do. So not trying to go too far back as I look at your reaction, but um, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and your expertise, Robert. Sure. Uh, I'm happy to do that. I'm smiling because I, uh, I'm plenty self-involved, but I am my least favorite topic. Uh, but, but I appreciate this is part of the, part of the conversation that you have on these, in this wonderful series. Um, I am uh, a Scorpio. I am from Miami, from a very large family. I have a degree in accounting and finance from uh, the Wharton School, and then really got my got my heart, my life, as they say, um, with a law degree from NYU, which trained me on the importance of law and public policy in the distribution of power, which has been an organizing principle for my career. I spent um, some years um, being, I hope, well-trained at a, at a very large law firm, uh, but, but I, I really found my professional calling when I went to work in Congress I spent seven years um, as counsel in the House of Representatives for just a blisteringly um, amazing cohort of members, uh, Congressman Barney Frank, Maxine Waters, Chuck Schumer, a, a group of people who are really making a difference in the lives of tens of millions of people. Um, and I spent seven years doing that and then was tapped to run a division at the Department of Justice in the Clinton administration, which was really a blessing to be able to serve uh, it's such an important agency, and for then, Attorney General Reno. But I started the Raven Group. Uh, it'll be 20 years uh, soon, uh, in part because uh, I interviewed poorly and couldn't get a job when I had to leave the government. But I think the, the real issue is I wanted to create a platform which I didn't see existing anywhere. And it's essentially, the Raven Group is an unusual firm. On one level, we're like other firms, we run campaigns, advocacy, communications, some case lobbying, branding, coalition management. We try to move systems through campaigns. On another level, there's nothing like us. We are at about 110 people, 70% people of color. We're 95% minority and female, visibly disabled, LGBTQ. So we've curated a professional demographic like no other in the country. And we're not organized around profit. We're organized around shifting or moving power to women and people of color. And um, it's a very special place. 
-hmm. And it gives us standing to be so invested in the Diverse Asset Managers Initiative. It's the DAMI, as we call it, is part of a much larger ecosystem. Most of the work we do is about looking at systems and figuring out how to get people of color into the, into the top or how to get power sharing. And you, you know, absolutely need that in asset management. You know, in the asset management industry, campaign is a seldomly used word. At least it is in the core business. Uh, when we think of campaigns, we often think of elected officials running for office, you know, often looking for support in, in, in many forms to, to take up the cause and to win an election. But when you say campaign, what are the elements of a campaign? How should one think of campaigns? I love that question. Thank you. And, and I'll answer it. But I, but I also learned, uh, you know, when you're going from sector to sector, in this case, we do work in the environmental sector. Mm -hmm. uh, we do work we do work in NGOs and, and electoral work. Um, language really matters. One of the reasons it's called the Diverse Asset Managers Initiative as opposed to the Minority Asset Managers Initiative is because we learned that minority is a term of art in asset management, and it refers to the type of shareholder as opposed to the um, demography. A campaign, I think we could look at similarly, every single one of you is involved in a campaign every day. If I'm a typical asset manager and I want a new client, I've got my eye on working with fill in the blank allocator, I'm engaged in a campaign. And I'll answer your question. The elements of a campaign are the following. It's the crisp identification of success. How do you know when you're done? Is there a specific quant or qualitative effort? So defining success is crucial and making sure you have agreement with the people you're working with on when we're done or what success looks like. Second, a campaign means the identification of specific audiences. There are defined groups of people or institutions that deliver the success you want. And so naming those audiences or institutions, then you figure out what's your baseline. As an asset manager might do research to figure out how to get a client. In a campaign, you have to know where your audience is. If I'm trying to get AT&T or Yale to rely on more African-Americans to manage their money, first I have to find out where AT&T is on that. Do they do it? What do they think about it? Do they know black people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Next, you need a strategy, which is the second hardest part of a campaign. You need to be able to say, and everyone working on a campaign needs to be able to say, this is the intellectual underpinning that describes how we're gonna organize ourselves to get the success. And then it's tactics. Tactics are what we do every day to drive the success. And then the wraparound for a modern campaign is communications. You have to use language that the audience can rely on and understand. Frequently we use language that we understand, but it's not clear that the people we're trying to move understands what you're trying to do or say. And so communications is a wraparound to all the elements I just said of a campaign. Excellent. So let's run Dami through um, that taxonomy or that paradigm. So the first is identification of success, gaining agreement. Uh, let's talk about that for Dami. Well, here's why I love working with you, Bob, and your membership. You tell me what success is. So I'm a campaign manager with deep experience in how systems move, strategy, and diversity. But I don't manage anybody's assets, including my own. I rely on the constituency to tell me what success looks like. Broadly, success means ending the gross underutilization of talented women and people of color. That's a broad statement. Mm -hmm. You want some quant around that. You have to know sort of, are we doing better? And what I observed in your sort of aspect of the profession is an enormous amount of the, of the conversation was based on anecdote. Larry got an allocation from Duke. Larry didn't get an allocation from Duke, but you take the point. Mm -hmm. or Stephen didn't get a meeting at Wilshire. Mm -hmm. All of that is real to the speaker, but it's impossible to know how the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And in order to move a system, particularly a system which says it relies on data, you need data. So the second thing that we did was to go out to the Knight Foundation, and we designed on their behalf 
a set of empirical studies, which Josh Lerner at Harvard Business School agreed to do, to set to get across a baseline. Number one, what is the supply of well-performing managers of color and women? And how are they being used? There are two critical variables to know. And, so, and the Knight Foundation, this was six, seven years ago, because they paid for it and because they're smart, they said, let us call it the Knight Study, not the Diverse Asset Managers Study. And I got into my feelings about that and said, but it's our idea. They were 100% right. Mm -hmm because of their leadership and who they are, it brought a stature and a standing to the inquiry and we still rely on the night studies. So the first thing we did was set a empirical data baseline mm -hmm. so that we can say, well, how do we know if we're improving? And then Knight has updated those studies. Illumin, Stanford did follow on studies. The other quant we do to try to set a baseline, we've done four years of surveys of the investment consulting firms. Mm -hmm to try to figure out their own diversity. Now, I wanna be very precise here. I care about the diversity of Wilshire, Cambridge, Makita, Marquette, fill in the blank, but white people are capable of allocating and recommending allocations to black and Hispanic and Asian American asset managers. Mm -hmm. This is not a one for one thing, but because the chance of an investment consulting firm telling me what I really want to know, which is, are they recommending allocations to people of color to their clients? They will never tell us that because they call that a strategy, even though it's not. It's a simple fact. I'm asking a proxy question. Do you employ Black people? Mm -hmm. Do you employ Hispanic people? And I'm trying to make a public conversation in a forensic People who are disinterested in employing professionals of color are likely not seeing the talent on the asset management side. Mm -hmm. So we do a quantitative survey uh, yearly to see whether the investment consulting firms are. You know, I'll stop there. There's more to say. But in answer to your question, success is significantly more allocations to firms owned or managed by women and people of color. And that can be measured in billions. Real success is the following, or I should say the success that will get us there is the following. When we have a critical mass of investment consulting firms who compete with each other to identify, curate, and recommend minority talent, I will go out of business. Mm -hmm. When investment consulting firms move from sort of the status quo, which is it's not our fiduciary duty to curate black people, black managers, to one in which they see it in their fiduciary interest because you're high performing mm -hmm. and because client demand is increasing. There are a handful of investment consulting firms who have got this. Mm -hmm. And that means that the work we're all doing is making a difference. But when we have critical mass, when there's 10 or 12 and they're competing with each other, then it will be catalytic. For sure. And, and clearly we're a long way from that. And, and both of us have a measure of job security, if not satisfaction around this. Um, I want to talk about obstacles. And um, I have not said it already, and I'll probably say it four more times, but I've learned so much from you around how to treat obstacles in this business, who to uh, position as an opponent, who to position as an ally. Um, but talk to me about the real and perceived obstacles that you had to learn about and learn how to mitigate or articulate around as it relates to your um, work in the financial services industry? It's a great question and thank you. And thank you for the, for the compliment. I appreciate that. And, and it means a lot to me given how much I re respect I have for your leadership. Uh, there is a structural obstacle that I think the Diverse Asset Managers Initiative was intended and is doing its part to solve. One is you can't change a significant system and there's an argument to be made that, that markets, the capital system in the strongest capitalist nation in the country is probably the most uh, important system we have, uh, apart from the three branches of government. 
you can't make significant change to a system with just an inside or just an outside game. Systems move when there is a coordinated inside and outside game. By that, I mean, when I, when I started paying attention to your field about 10 years ago, there was a project that I was doing for Melody Hobson and John Rogers on 401k plans. I realized that you mostly only had an inside game. By that, I mean the people seeking diversification mm -hmm. of asset management were people of color and white women who were asset managers. You are insiders pointing out the downside of the lack of diversity. Mm -hmm. You can only get so far with an inside game. What you, need is, what you needed was a coordinated outside game. By outside game, I mean elected officials, regulators, media, advocacy organizations, gadflies, mm -hmm. people who are not worried that, about biting the hand that will ultimately feed them. Mm -hmm. So the first thing was structural. You need many more, for this system to really change, you need many more outside players who will get under the hood of a very opaque and complicated system mm -hmm. and ask questions and, and call for results. And you're seeing it, mm -hmm. uh, but you need more of that. The other obstacle is sort of internal. Um, you know, I say this after much prayer and much thought and 30 years of experience. The racism and the sexism in your industry is preternatural. Mm -hmm. It is the, and I'm from the American South. I, 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 I won't go on and on about my standing. It's not like I am not been... Uh, unexposed to profound racism and intolerance in this country. Yep. This is another level. The, it was the last industry that I discovered in which the very premise that working with women or people of color was in dispute. Mm -hmm. Every, I'll say the exact same thing again because it's so existential here. Every other industry whether it's boards, C-suites, uh, senior management, vendors, get, just pick an industry and pick an angle on that industry. We've reached a point in American society where what other, whatever people privately think, no one says, yeah, it's a bad idea to have a black person on my board. Mm -hmm. In asset management, the majority of decision makers question the premise. Why does it matter? Mm -hmm. Money is money. If you're doing well and you're in the, is it called Prequin database? Yep. Then Frequent. we'll work with you. Prequin. The elegant and inelegant ways that mostly but not completely white leaders dispute the premise that the exclusion of women matters is what caused me to go from interested to passionate about working on this issue. Mm -hmm. The racism and the sexism is profound. I'm going to, I'm going to sort of add a, a recent proof point, which did not surprise me, but I find it useful. Morgan Stanley did a um, attitudinal survey released three or four months ago in which they surveyed thousands of professionals in financial services generally, and asked all kinds of attitudes, workplace, workplace flexibility, et cetera, et cetera. On questions of race and gender, the following was revealed. Almost 74% of white respondents told a surveyor, these are people telling a surveyor, that diversity in asset management is important, but it sacrifices performance. Yep. Almost 50% of people of color, it wasn't, they didn't disaggregate people of color by our color. So it's just people of color. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, in our field, in 2022, the majority of professionals believe that women and people of color cannot perform as well as white men. Mm -hmm. To answer your question, what is the single biggest obstacle? Sadly, it is the deeply held point of view of the decision makers 
that working with you costs performance. This is in the face of quantitative and persistent data that is, says the opposite. All of the data that we have shows that women and people of color perform at least at par. At the elite levels, it shows that people of color perform at higher rates than white people. So in a field in which it says it rests on data, the data doesn't seem to matter. Mm -hmm. So the single biggest auto obstacle is the unwillingness to pull the Band-Aid off of racism. Mm. I do my part at the Diverse Asset Managers Initiative. The leadership of the field is so genteel that I have to inhibit myself frequently to say what I think is actually going on so that I can at least be heard. Right. But the single biggest obstacle we have is racism. The second biggest obstacle, and then I'll stop, is incumbency. Mm -hmm. If I can persuade a trustee or a CIO or an allocator that I'm missing returns by not working with Hispanics, I've got to take that money some, from somebody. The CIO of NYU sadly told me They've been with J.P. Morgan for 43 years. I don't see ourselves making a change mm -hmm. when I pointed out the lack of diversity. And, and the good news is she's at least telling me her bottom line. But I think that the second biggest obstacle is incumbency protection and the unwillingness of people to, to sort of move from one manager to another. One of the things I've I've most enjoyed about working with Dami is the fact that you come with a set of relationships that are often different than the ones that we start with. Um, you have access points to organizations that allow a vectoring that is, you know, heretofore not really possible from a, an NAIC or from a, a trade association advocacy standpoint. But you've had a lot of conversations about this in a lot of different places. So what I'd like to do, Robert, is I'd like to walk through some of the different categories of capital allocators and understand the nuanced issues there. So I'm going to start with the, the public pension plan conundrum, right? You know, we fixate on public pension plans because they're, we're able to access them politically. There are big dollars um, across the United States but they're willing to talk to you and you can you can drive a conversation in some instances. But at the end of the day, there are many pension plans that do not recognize diversity as an investment strategy or an investment target area. Um, and even the ones that are so-called good actors, the ones on the various coasts in the major urban centers, um, they get stuck. Right. They get stuck on a certain number and they tend to allocate at the same amount over and over again. Um, what, do, what do you observe in the public pension plan space and where should we as advocates push? That's the simple question. What do you observe in the public pension plan space and what should we be doing that we are not? I love that question. I love that question. I, you know, there's a meadow, if we, as we go from sector to sector, you, yep. one, one through line is leadership. And, mm -hmm. and you know, sort of that's a platitude. Um, it's a platitude with great significance. The absence of leadership on diversity is devastating. And we can talk about sort of how that absence of leadership gets reinforced and rewarded. The presence of leadership on diversity is liberating. Mm -hmm. It both maximizes performance for the institution. Uh, it's just a breath of fresh air when the Denapoli, Tom Denapoli, you know, when I go out calling names, there's somebody in your audience who's going to sort of roll her eyes and say, I didn't get a meeting with them. Sure. I'm speaking broadly and I'm speaking relatively. I'm not mm -hmm. giving out Oscar awards here. I'm just saying there are people who have distinguished themselves as being more interested in maximizing performance through diversity. Mm -hmm. So the presence of leadership and rewarding that leadership is crucial. Um, and it's, and it's very, very personal. And, you know, people have examples in their, in their own, in their own lives and in their own work. I certainly have examples in every sector we're going to talk about 
yep. of somebody who says, let me get this right. Uh, uh, I will call out one. It's just, it's an interesting journey. Andrew Junkin uh, is a senior executive at Wilshire who uh, the Diverse Asset Managers Initiative went very hard on. And Andrew said at Wilshire, let me try to figure out on behalf of my investment consulting company how to do this better, how to institute a Rooney rule, how to reward people for curating people of color, et cetera. He could not move Wilshire. Mm -hmm. He just couldn't move that institution. They have not budged. Yep. He has gone on to be the treasurer, not the treasurer, but the uh, whatever the title is. In yeah. Robert. Thank you. Yep. But he brings into this job a learning curve and a journey about how to diversify a system, which will be breathtaking and invaluable for the people of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. It's an example of sort of personal leadership matters. And, and I, could, I could name others. On the pension side of the house, I, I think it's helpful if people pull the lens back. I believe it's useful to accept the fact that public pension plans are this hybrid entity. They are like schools, public schools, mm -hmm. and police forces. They are political entities that retain professionals to manage the work. Mm -hmm. But they are political entities. They are, well, you all know what a political entity is. Yep. And all of the crazy making aspects of these institutions can be explained when you dig into the very personal relationship between the political deciders and the professional deciders. Mm -hmm. This is true with the federal government with the largest pool of assets in the country, the federal pension plans. The relationship between the political actors, the trustees who are appointed by political people mm -hmm. or the mayor herself, um, Sitting on, the, sitting on the plan, depending on where you are. The relationship between the political people and the professional people is everything. Mm -hmm. If the political people come and go in fairly rapid succession, three-year terms, four-year terms, they have very limited influence. If the blah, 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 I won't sort of give every example. Yeah. So we have wonderful examples of long-term CIOs at public pension plans who've really made a difference. But the core, it requires two bodies of work that have to be coterminous. Mm -hmm. You have to pay very, very, very attention to the political class's appointments. Mm -hmm. You have to help the mayors and the governors and whomever has the authority to appoint with what professional, smart, equity-minded people look like. And then you have to support that process. And I don't mean give money, but you just have to provide the talent and train them. At the same time, you have to get in there with the green eye shades who are paid to be the long term, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to show them the talent and you have to push them. You have to work both sides of it. I think the fallacy and what's frustrating for many people trying to make change is they focus only on the political side of the equation. And it's very, very hard for a political appointee, say she's a schoolroom teacher mm -hmm. who has a three-year term on Cal Calsters, mm -hmm. very, very hard for that person to go have a peer conversation about risk adjustment and betas and arbitrage and, and, and. They just sort of get circled. Yeah. This is doable. The pension plans are an example of very good news with sustained effort political engagement, and by political, I don't mean giving money. Mm -hmm. A strong believer that there's a lot of work to be done short of giving money. Political engagement and sustained professional effort to show the professional class the talent, you can make real change. So you've talked a lot about the affirmative side of things and, and the power of leadership and, and the power of influence. Um, I, I have a, a, a bit of a theory, if, if I can use such a, a broad word around my own thoughts, and I want to get your reaction to it. Uh, 30 years of advocacy work with public pension plans has, in many cases, made some of the most targeted pension plans not better investors in diversity and more committed investors in diversity, but they've made them better at talking about diversity 
and creating tactics that move away from the absolute goal of allocating capital and begin to count people that attend conferences, count meetings with managers, count other things. Can you talk a little bit about the adverse effect of what has happened with our advocacy? Sure. It's a graduate school seminar. It's a great question, and it's absolutely a theory. Uh, change is hard. Period. Newsflash. Change is hard. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to sort of eat more and not gain weight. Change is hard. Mm -hmm. um, two, we are talking here about race. We are talking here about gender. I live in a country that I love whose racism is uh, exponentially large. People are taught in small and large ways that black people, Hispanic people, some Asian Americans are not as competent or qualified. Mm -hmm. That is part of our educational system. I watched senators of the United States treat one of the most brilliant women I've ever seen, Katanji Jackson, mm -hmm. like a moron. Mm -hmm. So race, change around race and gender is hard. Second newsflash. To be, to be specific about your uh, question, yes. First, I want to be critical of my own people, those of us who are clamoring for change. I started a conversation with you about campaigns, and I said the second hardest part was strategy. Mm -hmm. The first hardest part, I know that's not proper English, but the first hardest part is defining success. We are frequently imprecise either because we're lazy or we don't want to do the hard work of agreeing among ourselves exactly what we're asking for. And that becomes a crabs in a barrel phenomenon. If you don't ask for what you want, you run the risk of the man satisfying your stated goal with something you didn't want. I'll give you a very specific example. Uh, when we lost Thurgood Marshall on the court, we wanted an African-American on the Supreme Court. We want an African-American on the Supreme Court. We want an African-American on the Supreme Court. We got Clarence Thomas. He is an African-American. He he's a, on the court. He's a brilliant man and he's on the court and he's a justice. Shame on us for being imprecise about what success looked like. We wanted an African-American who embodied a certain point of view about cruel and unusual punishment or whatever we wanted. So part of the problem with the CalPERS and the CalSTERS and the KKRs and the Carlisles and some of the most significant institutions in the country is we're not asking for the precise thing that we want. We want power. We want power sharing. We want the Melody Hobsons and the Jose Felicianos, and I'm not going to go down the list, but we want, we want our incredibly talented people to have all the zeros behind their names that they deserve given the talent. That's right. Instead, we are, you have to diversify. Mm -hmm. The more significant the institution, the more likely they are to put a lot of money into what I call the kids. Mm -hmm. When you look at the platinum sponsors of SEO and Twigo and the Thurgood Marshall Fund at the, and the UNCF, mm -hmm. they are the most significant asset management firms in the country. And they're the most significant financial institutions in the country. For several generations now, in response to the constructive and real criticism that they don't have Black people or Hispanic people in the middle of the top, they double down on the kids. Yep. They claim that it's a supply problem. Mm -hmm. And we take the money and we let them. And it's great for the kids. Yeah. But after three generations, you claim it's a supply problem and you've got the kids, but you're not retaining them. You're hiring them, but you're not retaining them. That's right. Then I don't think we have a supply problem in the United States. I think we have a demand problem. Mm -hmm. So it's two pieces. One, the advocates have to be more precise and sharper about what we want. And two, there have to be consequences for this persistent sexism and this persistent racism. Yeah. And currently there aren't. I, I have cried for the day. Okay, I'm a little dramatic. I have cried for the day 
that one of these investment, one of these allocators that put out great statements about their diversity and post George Floyd and, and, and the killing of Breonna Taylor, how much they care about equity. Mm -hmm. I would like one of them to make public a contract they ended because the vendor couldn't diversify fast enough. That's right. Show me a consequence. Tell me a little bit less about the $500,000 you gave to the UNCF, good for the UNCF. Mm -hmm. One should contribute to the UNCF. Tell me a little bit less about that, a little bit more about we had to fire Larry. He's been with us 15 years and he never hired a black person. And we decide, right? And that's not what you're seeing. Yeah. And until well, there are consequences, you're not going to have the kind of change I'm interested in. So I'm going to use that as a bridge to get back to the foreshadowed question I said. The next category is corporate America. So we all experienced what I like to refer to as the summer of awakening, 2020, the summer of awakening, right? Long, hot summer, part two. Lots of dollars were announced. Lots of initiatives were announced. And being just about two years away from that, we can fully see the retrenching and we can fully see the waning of that happening. There are websites out there that are tracking what's not happening. But what talk to us about the challenge in getting corporations many of whom experience a trade deficit with communities of color to get them to invest, right? They're short of their supplier diversity goals, but they won't make it up by investing the capital. Talk a little bit about what we face in corporate America. Uh, we essentially face a white citizens council. Um, and, and I know that's harsh language. Um, and and, and I, I think the more appropriate answer is we face a significant sector of the American economy that hasn't really faced the issue yet. I think the next line of advocacy is going to be with corporate America. We have, through a combination of many, many people's work, including the Diverse Asset Managers Initiative, we now have critical mass of major foundations, universities, pension plans, and high net worth individuals that are interested in solving these problems and doing better. And there's sort of centers of gravity in each of those sectors where different people, and we can talk about that, are sort of working on how to do this better. We don't have that in corporate America. And in part, we haven't tried. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have tried tactically. We tried with AT&T. That did not work. Um, but I don't think I have seen, at least in the seven years I've been working on this, a comprehensive effort to focus on corporate America. That is going to begin, uh, if I can do my own foreshadowing, in the next few weeks. I think we're going to see a major overture from a, from a very significant leader to corporate America asking for a public conversation, which will then set in motion the ability for those of us who want to be involved to ask a lot of questions. But there is no, except for Exelon, there is no tracking and reporting in corporate America about utilization of, of minority and women asset managers. And therefore, there's no civil society around corporate America pushing them. It is the next frontier. So I want to talk about one more. We could go through all five or six, but I want to talk about one more because of the obvious disconnect. And that would be the foundation and endowment space. Um, no institution in America uh, has spoken more about diversity and its importance than academia. And academia obviously relates to the endowment space. And no institution has done more, no group of institutions has done more on a, on a programmatic level to put dollars in it than the foundation space. Yet we have this category that is no better, and frankly, in some cases, much worse than the other categories at investing with women and people of color. Can you talk about that disconnect and, and what can be done about it? Yeah. The... Um... Good news with found with philanthropy and university endowments. They're slightly different, but but they're similar enough to talk about together. The good news is they have the thinnest skin of any institutions. Mm -hmm. They're very, very, very susceptible to criticism, which is interesting, particularly with philanthropy. You would think that people who give away money sort of uh, are impervious to that, but they're not. 
And so I only say that, I don't say that as sort of, I'm not practicing therapy without a license. I'm saying as a campaign manager, your ability to effectuate change with institutions who really don't want criticism is a little easier. Mm-hmm. And we have seen that in, in philanthropy. It's a couple of things. Um, the most interesting thing I learned uh, in, in this effort, which shifted sort of how I have to approach this, Generally speaking, the CIO at a university and a major foundation can make two to three to four to five times more than what the president makes. Mm -hmm. I had just assumed that like so many other things, that if you want to move this opaque system of asset management at Yale, at Princeton, at Notre Dame, um, at Pick a Foundation, that you sort of go to the head of it, you go to the trustees, you talk about what you're missing, you show them that other foundations, the Public Welfare Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is actually moving along and doing very well with diversification. No, I, it took me a couple of years to realize that the trustees and the president of a university and a foundation don't sit in a board meeting and don't sit in a committee and tell Nick Saban at the University of Alabama how to run plays. I had to go look that analogy up. That's so you have to understand the political distribution in these institutions. So the key is having to move a CIO. The problem is the CIO, number one, the CIO doesn't want to talk about anything. I don't want to talk about boycott of Israel. I don't want to talk about excluding menthol cigarettes. I don't want to talk about weapons. I don't want to talk about gender. Mm -hmm. So it's not personal per se. So one is who has the power, two is the opacity. But once you get into that conversation, The CIO quietly says to the trustees, let me tell you something. My 40% return, my 10% return is what gave us need blind admissions. Mm -hmm. You Amherst have a 50% entering class of color because of my subsidization. So you want to mess with that? And it's the extremely rare trustee that will say, yeah, first of all, by working with black people, you're not messing with that. You're going to improve your performance. Mm -hmm. So I sort of sketched out the declension of problems that you have at these institutions. We will move them. Mm -hmm. We will move them because the data shows high performance. We will move them because a growing group of alumni will work with us to say to these institutions, wait, you, we, Duke, we, we Prince, I'll pick on Princeton because I think they're the worst in the country that I know of. You, Princeton, worked with one black person in 19 years. You have a hundred and something managers all around the globe. You will go to Hong Kong and curate people, but you can't see Eddie Brown in Baltimore. So, We are seeing a critical mass of institutions changing. The University of California is best in class in rhetoric. Mm -hmm. They have got religion in terms of how to think about and how to talk about it. It's too soon to know whether their allocations will follow their rhetoric. Mm -hmm. But I look at that model as an example of a, it's $120 billion, Mm -hmm. it's a lot of money. I look at that as an example of how progress is made Uh, It's leadership. At first they were forced to, and then they said, you don't have to force us. We believe in this. Mm -hmm. And I think they're doing uh, very modern work in figuring out how to move a big system. Um, I think Georgetown is doing that on a smaller scale. I I won't go down the list, but um, good news is we can move these systems. It really takes concentrated effort because they are stubborn. So, Robert, in the beginning, you talked about your background. You talked about um, the work that you did on several congressional staffs. Uh, The Rabin Group is, uh, I think, was listed as one of the top 20 public advocacy shops, public policy shops. What, What is happening on the legislative front? And is there relief there or is there a holy grail there that's going to save us all from years of trying to do this work. Uh, Is there magic in legislation? And and if so, what is it? Yes. Uh, Yes, it is. It is not the elixir 
the legislation cannot fix the central problem, which is bias. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the permanently interesting aspect of a campaign, at least intellectually for me, is it, it takes hundreds of tactics to move a strat to move a system. Mm -hmm. And you never know which tactic is going to be dispositive. And so you have to try multiple tactics always. And they work together, and sometimes the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So to not be abstract, you have to work with media to draw attention. You have to do surveys. You have to have whistleblowers. You have to show best practices. You have to sort of put together a fiduciary guide for trustees to show how other institutions are moving along. So it takes dozens of tactics from multiple organizations moving coordinatedly or sometimes fighting with each other to move a system. In that context, elected officials are crucial. They have a bully pulpit. They can do two things. They can legislate. Side note, they can attempt to legislate, which sometimes moves institutions. So I, I saw recently that SEIU did a uh, proxy fight, a shareholder proxy fight to get BlackRock to do a racial equity audit. Mm -hmm. BlackRock agreed to do it before the shareholder vote. So they didn't have to have legislation. They didn't have to have a vote. Mm -hmm. BlackRock agreed to do it. So the attempt at legislation or talking about legislation is its own cudgel. But you want two things out of elected officials. You want the possibility of legislating to actually move a system. But you also want them talking. You want them calling in people and asking questions. I tried for three years to get any university in the United States to give me the, da the data on whether or not they work with black people in asset management, Hispanics in asset management. Georgetown was the only university to answer me. Dozens and dozens of universities told me to piss off. I went to Congress and Congressman Cleaver and Kennedy wrote a letter, a letter that we could have written mm -hmm. to the top 25 university endowments and 24 of the 25 answered. Notre Dame refused to answer. So it's an example, and there are many, and I won't go on and on, Elected officials who are well briefed and well studied can be crucial in getting data, asking questions, and moving a system by talking about or threatening a change in the rules that we want. I'm going to give you one example and then I'll stop, which is aspirational. It's, very, it's really for the wonks who are watching. The current ERISA rule around fiduciary duty is basically diversity is a permissible aspect of fiduciary duty. And there's actually a fight between the left and the right about whether that's appropriate. And the Obama administration said it was, that's the rule, and the Trump administration cut it back. It's the wrong fight. You ultimately want the rule under ERISA to be that diversity is a required component of fiduciary duty. Mm -hmm. If all of the quantitative analysis shows that the existence of a diverse pool of managers or a diverse portfolio improves performance, then diversity is a required part of fiduciary duty. It's not permissible. Mm -hmm. So what one should do if you sort of want to take the long horizon is you want legislation at the federal and state level that lays that down. Mm -hmm. That would be a slog to get that done. Institutional investors will cry and scream because they don't want that legislated, but it could happen. I, I, I saw gay marriage happen in my lifetime. That's a sort of high-end example of the importance of a legislative body. The, the ones that are more concrete that you see is the state of Illinois is the only state that effectively sets minimums for participation by Illinois pension plans for people of color, women, et cetera. No other state has that, but that's a very concrete example of legislation which required a system change. So I'm a big believer. Um, in working with elected officials, but, but the point is that it's twofold. It's not just regulation, mm -hmm. it's bully pulpit. And um, we've been more and more effective uh, at the federal and state level in working with elected officials to sort of jawbone 
and move some of these larger organizations. So um, they say no good lawyer should ask a question that they don't know the answer to. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I will go out on a limb here. Um, you have learned a number of things in this journey, and you have been gracious in sharing those with some of us. Um, if you're in the state of California, and if you are talking to a public pension plan, and in some cases, other institutions, they will tell you with a recline and crossed arms that Prop 209 prohibits me from doing that. What do they mean by that? And is that actually true? Yes. Yes. I'm doing a moment of silence for the persistent ignorance of even very intelligent people. Um, so for those who don't know, but probably probably most of your audience does, Proposition 209 uh, is, is a uh, statewide passed referendum of, of several decades now in California that prohibits the use of preferences, preferences in gender, race, and other categories. Uh, it's sort of an anti-affirmative action measure. And yes, it is ubiquitously, almost ubiquitously raised by decision makers at public institutions in California as an absolute bar in them um, allocating by race and gender. Um, it's inaccurate as a matter of law. Um, the Appropriations Committee of the California Assembly dealt with this canard so frequently that they held a hearing and issued a report, which I'm happy to circulate to your membership, which enumerated all the things that public institutions in California could do to identify, support, curate, and select women of people of color in procurement, asset management, et cetera. There's a whole list of things that one can do that the California Assembly felt not in violation of Proposition 209. So to your second question, it's not accurate. To your first question, you know, God bless the right. They've done a wonderful job of demeaning and inhibiting any effort that this country has made to advance the situation of women and people of color. There is no advancement that the right has not figured out a tagline, a statement, a trope, a narrative, which undermines it. Mm -hmm. You see that with our most talented people of color who go to Ivy League schools and the number of white and some people of color who think they got there because of affirmative action. Mm -hmm. There is no field of success where talented people of color are not questioned about the very standing they have to be where they are. So in that cultural milieu, in that educational system, it's very, very easy for people who didn't want to move on race and gender anyway to glue themselves to this canard as the reason why they're not moving on race and gender. The most effective thing I find in California is everything I just said, the person who uttered the phrase listening to me doesn't go, oh, you're right, I'm really, I'm really wrong. That's just not how life works. I find the most effective thing to do is to point to the number of public institutions in California that have beautifully diversified, notwithstanding Proposition 209, and that's La Serra and Alameda County. I mean, you just have public plan after public plan that seems to have figured out how to work with women and people of color with no legal problems. Mm -hmm. And then the most caustic thing, I, I know after listening to me for 53 minutes, you can't imagine that I have yet another level of causticity, but I'm going to go there. The most caustic thing one wants to say to CalPERS and CalSTRS, which are the two large institutions that constantly tell you about Proposition 209 being a bar, and it's why their only energy is around emerging, because you can set up an emerging program which has no mention of race and gender, and the lawyers say, oh, no 209 problem. The most caustic thing I can think of to say, and I've, it's sadly accurate to CalPERS and CalSTRS, 
if 95% or more of your whatever it is now, $500 billion is managed by white people, then it is a prima facie violation of Proposition 209. You are de facto only curating white people to manage your money, and someone ought to take you to court, and if it were criminal, take you to jail for violating 209 because you are engaging in preferences. You're picking white people. Yep. But that sort of obviousness doesn't even come onto the table of conversation. People are so inculcated with this notion that black people, Hispanics, don't have a seat at the table, shouldn't have a seat at the table, can't envision you as anything but emerging. Every step of the way, they've got you in your box. And it becomes easier if that's your point of view to utter these canards. That's right. And and we have been willing to play those games by supporting the use of terms like emerging, guilty, um, the use of conferences as proxies for commitment and success, guilty, and standing in long lines to shake one person's hand only for them to tell you when you finally get a meeting, it's been wonderful to meet you, but we can't do anything because of Prop 209. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. I want to ask you one more question and then we'll do a wrap up. And again, in the spirit of not knowing your view on this, I'll state mine and, and see where you fall out. Um, we asked for diversity. This goes back to your question of what we ask for. We ask for diversity, and in many places around the country, it had to be repackaged as emerging, right? We are now seeing of two things that you and I know are very important, the environment and diversity, we are seeing enormous traction around ESG as a complex tablet of many things. And people are fond of the refrain that, Diversity is included in that because it is in the S, right? And this is the process by which everybody's mind to gets, gets trained to do and say certain things. I believe it is very dangerous to abandon the DEI focus and inject it into a broader ESG initiative because I think you lose the narrative. Uh, your thoughts around how DEI and ESG relate and should be leveraged going forward. People are going to think we're cartoons with all these initials and acronyms. Um, I'm all about the ESG, but it's a G, not an S. Right. Uh, uh, if we could, if we could be more disciplined about making sure that diversity, inclusion of the talented among us, is a governance issue, mm -hmm. because it's a fiduciary duty issue. That's, that's sort of where my logic goes. If it were clearly seen as fiduciary duty, then people would treat it like a G. Modern governance requires this form of oversight and this form of inclusion. I think the S can be a disaster. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll, I'll say it's only, it's only a minute left and I'm raising a big thing. One of the challenging pieces of doing this work, so much of systems change around race and gender has a civil rights context and frame in this country for obvious mm -hmm. reasons. Every time we push a civil rights narrative, an injustice narrative around asset management, we're reinforcing the man's basic bias that what the Morgan St Stanley study showed, yes, it may be a social good to work with black people, but my returns are going to be less. Mm -hmm. and so I'll take one or two of you, the emerging, but I'm not going to put my real money there. Right. So the trick of this work is to follow the following narrative. The exclusion of people of color and white women for 300 years is a social injustice. Mm -hmm. The inclusion going forward is a performance matter. Mm -hmm. We are not righting a wrong. We are accepting that there was a wrong. But if you want to be a modern institution and maximize your returns, you need to work with the talent. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, there's some subtlety to that distinction. And uh, sometimes in a movement and the cacophony of sort of the day to day, that subtlety gets lost. So the, the, the larger piece I worry about with ESG, it's not just that it's a G, not an S, 
it's that an S reinforces that this is some sort of social justice, civil rights issue. Mm -hmm. And I want to take it out of that. I want people to do what they say they do, which is follow the numbers. That's right. And look at all these NAIC members and people who should be members with very high numbers. And why aren't you working with them? That's the salient and exciting conversation. That is a great place for us to end. Robert, you've been a fabulous guest. Uh, I thank you so much for the work that you are doing. Uh, I look forward to continuing the struggle with you. And I look forward to that day when you and I no longer have jobs and opportunities in this area. Amen. I appreciate you. And thank you for your leadership. Thank Thanks you, Robert. Take care.